So in this video, we're going to look at proteins in terms of their structure and their function. So let's start with the actual function of proteins, i.e. what we use them for. You will come across a lot of these during the course. Some of these you should already know. So enzymes is a classic example that you should already know. Likewise, hormones like adrenaline and insulin. Be careful because some hormones are steroid based, as mentioned in a previous video. You've also got protein channels or carriers. Those are the ones within the membrane. So they'll be responsible for facilitated diffusion and active transport, for example. You have them acting as antigens, so allowing the recognition of self. You have them acting as receptors, so that something like a hormone combined to them to cause a reaction within the cell. You've also got pigments, so things like melanin in the skin or chlorophyll, those are pigments and they are made of proteins. So what do we know about proteins from GCSE? Well, we know that proteins are a polymer and we know that they're a polymer of amino acids. That should not be new to you, but we need to go a little bit further than that. So if we have a look at the structure of an amino acid, this is a generic amino acid and you'll see why in a minute. So we start off with one end, which has a COOH group. That is called our carboxylic acid group. For those of you who did um, triple chemistry at GCSE, you would have come across carboxylic acids in chemistry. That is then joined to another carbon in the middle, which has a hydrogen and what we call an R group. And the R group will come back to in a minute, but it is a variable region. So that means it stands for many different things. And then finally at the end, you've got your NH2 group and your NH2 group is an amine group, hence the name amino acid. So this is a generic amino acid. Now, why do I say that? And that's because there are actually 21 different amino acids which are used in proteins in humans. Now, how do you make 21 different amino acids from here? And that's all to do with this variable region over here. So what we mean by a variable region is that this region can change. So for example, it could just be hydrogen. And that will make one specific amino acid. Or it could be a CH3 group, which will make a different amino acid. And so on and so forth. It could even have sulfur in there which will make, again, another amino acid. Now, you're not expected to know any amino acids and their R groups. You're just expected to understand that's what we mean by the R group. The R group can be different, and because it's different, you get different amino acids, and those different amino acids have slightly different properties because of that R group. And that will be really important when it goes to bond, when the... Um, amino acid chain actually folds up on itself. So when we talk about proteins, we think about them in terms of structure. And there are three levels of structure in most proteins, and some have a fourth. So we've got primary, secondary, tertiary, and for some proteins, quaternary. We're obviously going to start at the bottom, well, the top, with the primary structure of the protein. And the primary structure is basically the sequence of amino acids.
in a polypeptide chain. Now, what do I mean by a polypeptide chain? Well, let's have a look at two amino acids again. So if I take my two amino acids, so I've got my COH group, my C with my R group, my hydrogen, doesn't matter which way up you draw these, and my NH2. And then next to it, I've got my next amino acid, COH, CRH, NH2. And I'll draw a third one in. And there we go. So we're going to join these amino acids together. And once again, this is a condensation reaction. So a condensation reaction means we're going to remove water. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove water over here will join these two amino acids together and we'll move water over here which will then join it again and when we do that what we will end up with we should be able to work out is we have our amino acid at the end like so, and that is now co connected directly between the nitrogen and the carbon, and likewise between the next one, which is now directly connected as well. So we've got now three amino acids joined in a chain, and the bond within it is called a peptide bond. So again, condensation reaction will join your amino acids together to make a peptide bond. If you want to go back again, which obviously you do during digestion, then that will be a hydrolysis reaction. So if we go back to our, our um, definition of our amino acids, go all the way back to the top, yeah? It's a polymer of amino acids joined by peptide bonds. Made in a condensation reaction. And we know that condensation reactions release water as the byproduct. So our primary structure of our protein is very simply the sequence of amino acids that you've got. Bearing in mind that each R group could be different. So you could have three different amino acids here. You could have two the same, one different. You could have three identical ones and so on. Obviously, um, um, a polypeptide chain can be anything. It could be a, a thousand amino acids long. So you've got a wide variety of sequences that you could produce. And that's primary structure that sequence of amino acids is determined by the DNA, by the sequence of bases within the DNA. When we do protein synthesis, then we'll look at the link between the sequences, sequence of bases and the amino acid chain. So that is the primary structure. The primary structure will then go on to form the secondary structure. Now, what do we mean by that? So if we have our primary sequence of amino acids there, then that will fold in on itself. And it can fold to do to, to either form what we call an alpha helix, or it could fold to form a what we call a beta pleated sheet. So we define the secondary structure as being folding of the primary structure to form an alpha helix or beta pleated sheet held 
together by hydrogen bonds. Now, you may remember, we we're talking about hydrogen bonds in a previous video. Hydrogen bonds is the idea that you've got a slightly negative oxygen and a slightly positive hydrogen, and there's an attraction between them. So for example, the carboxyl group on an amino acid is ever so slightly what we call delta negative. But the NH2 group, hydrogens are ever so slightly positive. So you can get a bond, a very a bond formed between them, which is essentially an attraction. So what's happening is you are getting a hydrogen bonds forming between the CO group of one amino acid and the NH2 group of another amino acid. And that's holding this structure together. Now you can break hydrogen bonds by heating them or changing the pH. Um, and we'll come to that more when we talk about things like enzymes. But it's the idea that if you've got, if you imagine if I sort of expand on that a little bit, if I sort of bring that in, okay, and I imagine I've got a chain of amino acids which is forming my coil, so to speak, like that. So I've got an attraction between the negative oxygen of one amino acid and the positive hydrogen of the next, and that's what a hydrogen bond is. So it's nothing to do with the R group, it's to do with the carboxylic acid group of one amino acid and the amine group of another amino acid. That leads us to what we call the tertiary structure. Now, if I draw the tertiary structure in first, you'll see what I mean, and then we'll sort of add the definition to it. So we have our alpha helix or beta theta sheet or mixture of the two normally. And what that's going to do now is it's going to literally fold in on itself like that to give a more three-dimensional structure. But the important thing is that this structure is held together by a variety of bonds. Now that variety of bonds depends on the R groups and that's because those bonds, they could be hydrogen bonds, but they could equally as well be ionic bonds if you've got charged R groups. They could be the, what we call disulfide bonds if you've got sulfur in your R group. They could even be what we call hydrophobic or hydrophilic interactions, which are interactions between groups that repel or attract water. So we describe the tertiary structure as a 3D structure formed when the secondary structure folds. And the really important bit is this bit. It is held together by bonds between the R groups. And those bonds could be hydrogen bonds, it could be ionic, it could be disulfide, as just a few examples. Now why is that important? Because it means that if you put the incorrect amino acid in your original primary structure, which is what often happens because of the mutation, then it probably won't affect the secondary structure of the protein. But the tertiary structure will now not form the correct bonds because you've got the wrong R group because you have the wrong amino acid and therefore it will not have the correct shape to carry out its function because it's this tertiary structure that gives proteins their shape. So for example, it gives the enzymes the shape of that active site. It gives hormones the shape that allows them to bind to the receptor. So this is really important, okay? The idea that we have those bonds between the R groups, specifically hydrogen or ionic or disulfide, you don't need to name all three, but you need to remember one or two of them. And if we disrupt that bonding in any way, then the protein will no longer have the correct tertiary structure. So last thing to think about, 
is a, what we call a quaternary structure, which not all proteins have. In fact, most proteins don't. Let me spell that. Quaternary. Apologies for that. Okay, so the quaternary structure. So that, as it obviously comes after a tertiary structure. So again, I'm going to draw one in. So my example is going to be hemoglobin, which is the pigment found in red blood cells. Okay, so what do we notice? Each of these are polypeptide chains. They're each a tertiary structure of their own. So we define a quaternary structure as when more than one polypeptide chain interacts together form your protein. Sometimes that quaternary structure will have other things like a heme group for example in hemoglobin, what we call a prosthetic group, um, but that's not necessarily always the case. Um, but the important thing is that you've got more than one polypeptide chain. Um, so not all proteins will need that, which is why a lot of proteins stop at tertiary structure but many proteins will have a quaternary structure, more than one polypeptide chain. Another example will be an antibody, which again is made up of different polypeptide chains that bond together to form an antibody. All of these different proteins we're gonna come across through the course and look at the structures, understanding the principles of the structure of the protein.